Good afternoon, Your Excellencies, ladies and, and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Tim Huxley, Executive Director of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, Asia. Um, this is the international office of the London-based IISS, uh, but uh, we're located full-time here in Singapore. I'm delighted to welcome you to this 22nd IISS Fullerton Lecture, which will be delivered here in the ballroom of the Fullerton Hotel in Singapore by Madame Fu Ying on the in intriguing and very important theme of the evolving nature of the international order with particular respect to the roles of China and the United States in that order. With the extremely generous encouragement and support of the Fullerton Group, which owns and operates this magnificent heritage hotel close to Singapore's financial district, we started the Fullerton Lecture Series slightly more than three years ago in April 2012 with the intention of stimulating informed debate in Singapore and its region regarding political, economic, and security issues of international significance. Since the beginning, we've tried to ensure that the series presents the widest possible range of international viewpoints on some of the most important topics of the day, and that the speakers in the series address topics from the most authoritative perspectives. The series began with an address by the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, and has subsequently included lectures by the serving presidents of Mexico and Ukraine, the, uh, by current and former prime ministers, and by a number of foreign ministers. Only last week, Indian Foreign Secretary Jai Shankar delivered the 21st Fullerton Lecture here in this very room. It's impressive, but not at all surprising that we have such a large audience of more than 200 influential people from diverse sectors of the Singapore community here today to listen to Madame Fu Ying. Madame Fu is a famous and distinguished representative of her country internationally, as well as being one of China's, China's leading intellectuals in the field of foreign policy and international relations. After postgraduate studies at the University of Kent in England and diplomatic postings in Romania and Indonesia, and with the United Nations Transitional Authority in Cambodia, Madame Fu served as her country's ambassador to successively the Philippines, Australia, and the United Kingdom. From 2000 until 2003, she was Director General of the Department of Asian Affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Beijing. Madame Fu was subsequently Vice Foreign Minister and is now Chairperson of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the 12th National People's Congress. And at the same time, she is associated with uh, various universities and uh, prestigious think tanks in China. In her Fullerton Lecture today, Madame Fu will address crucial questions regarding the contemporary international order and its durability, including the part that China can play, perhaps in collaboration with the United States, in reshaping this order in the interests of security and prosperity in this region and globally. It's hard to think of anyone better qualified than Madame Fu Ying to address this crucially significant topic from a Chinese perspective, she will speak for approximately 25 minutes, after which there'll be an opportunity for members of our audience here today to ask questions on topics uh, relevant to the theme of Madame Fu Ying's lecture. Madame Fu, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tim Huxley. First of all, I want to apologize for being late a few minutes. I can't blame the traffic. The traffic is very good. <laughs> and, uh, I was late myself. Uh, we, fin uh, we finished uh, the speech this morning and I had some printing problem. So I think uh, I'm sure you're happy that I came with a, with a copy at all. Uh, it's a, uh, I, I feel privileged to be invited to speak to this uh, lecture. Actually, I was invited last year, and uh, I delayed it again and again because I didn't know what to talk about. Until recently, Henry Kissinger's uh, book uh, on world order 
uh, it's a Chinese edition was published in China, which generated uh, tremendous interest. And uh, we, you all notice that uh, in the past uh, one, to, one or two years, there has been lots of debate about world order, about international order. Uh, and the question is, uh, uh, driven by the globalization, emerging countries uh, have uh, are rapidly rising. So will, they, will, will this new situation lead to new changes in the world? In the world order or in the international order in the 21st century? Lots of uh, 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 Chinese uh, scholars are also, uh, are also participating in this debate, in this discussion. And China, uh, which has uh, become the second largest economy uh, in 2010, uh, is a socialist country with a big population and unique history and culture. And at this moment, it's going through profound transformation itself. And the questions I'm often asked is, uh, 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 what, what China wants from the world, and what can China offer to the world? And uh, is China going to challenge the current uh, world order, which is uh, dominated by the United States? So uh, this, uh, these questions uh, are uh, have generated lots of interests, uh, and uh, many Chinese scholars are also thinking and uh, discussing what kind of order do we want for the 21st century? Uh, what is the best way to, to, to make sure that the 21st century is uh, peaceful and is prosperous? And I've read lots of uh, Chinese scholars' uh, uh, literature on uh, how they think about the current uh, world. Generally speaking, uh, for, for China, uh, where food stamps were still uh, printed, until, printed until 1993, uh, the question, these questions uh, for the general public uh, uh, sound a bit uh, premature. Uh, the young generation of Chinese, young people born in the 1980s or the 90s, uh, uh, they are the first generation of Chinese who have grown up uh, without feeling hungry. So uh, maybe on the one hand, China's economy, economic standing is rising in the world. But for the general public, what matters more is the per capita GDP, which determines their living standards. Uh, that said, the Chinese people are not uh, uh, totally indifferent to what happens in the world. The experience from the colonial era left a deep imprint on the Chinese outlook on international relations and order with, uh, with a strong emphasis in China on inclusiveness and on fairness. Uh, so uh, today I, 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 try, I will try to share with you uh, some uh, of my views, and also based on some of the views I understand from the Chinese, other Chinese scholars. Uh, in the Chinese, we say pao zhuan yin yu, to chip in with a piece of a break in order for the jade to follow. I know there are lots of uh, good scholars here, and I'm sure you will come up with your views as well. Uh, I'll start with uh, uh, an observation on the current US-led world order, how I see it, uh, followed by China's experience with the international order, and then maybe uh, uh, do a bit of comparison, and then some comments about what, what's next, the challenges, and how, how do we go, go about. Uh, first, uh, let's look at the world order led by the United States. Uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger, his book, uh, World Order, gave a, a thorough view of the world order. And my take is that he has a very, very strong belief in, with the, in the Westphalian system, which he also believed needs to be modernized. And he spent uh, lots of uh, uh, paragraphs on, on, on it. 
And the Westphalia system put an end to the anarchy among European nation states and provided the basis for a body, for a body of laws and mechanisms underpinning the modern international relations. Uh, but from its very start, it was a Western order and not for, universe, not for universal purposes, especially from, from the point of view of many countries which were colonized. This order was more of an inclusive uh, and uh, inclusive club. And its later versions, uh, we, we, as we see it, had uh, this inherent flaw. Um, in other words, uh, the, uh, the, the order is important. The Westphalian order uh, is important, and yet it's not a, un it's not a universal uh, system. And as uh, Henry Kissinger also mentioned in his book, that at the same time, there are many other uh, order systems or order concepts that existed in other parts of the world. And uh, uh, in the last century, it took US about a century to complete its rise and establish its leadership position in the Western world, uh, world order system. After the end of the Cold War, the U.S. tried uh, to quickly spread this order to the rest of the world. Uh, in November 1990, the U.S. President George Bush Sr. Uh, used the term New World Order uh, to describe, uh, to declare a new framework of American global strategy. Uh, I was uh, I was in Asian, uh, I was a student interpreter. I remember trying to understand the lines and his, in his speech. He emphasized the irreplaceable leadership of the United States. Uh, as, far, as far as I can see, the new world order, uh, 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 the experience of the new world order and the pra practices uh, later on has uh, three components. One is the Western value system at its, uh, as its moral high standpoint. Second is the American military alliance system uh, as its security base. And the third is the American fundamental international, uh, uh, I mean, the American formulated international economic and financial structures as the foundation of the world economy. And according to uh, the American uh, con conception of world order, the way I understand, the United Nations system is meant to reflect and uh, to follow through on the principles and terms of U.S.-led world order. Uh, obviously, uh, the current order system, this order system, has uh, facilitated progress in the world, especially after the Cold War, Economic globalization has uh, grown full-fledged. Uh, capital, markets, technology, and the production have all been able to diffuse to other corners of the world, allowing many developing countries long been in the periphery uh, to have an opportunity to develop. And uh, a country like China, which has a big population and was uh, uh, in poverty uh, uh, until then, grasped this opportunity and achieved leapfrog development. Two months ago, I visited India, and there I heard much talk of how to attract investment and how to be creative. I could feel that another big country is in the preparation for economic takeoff. Uh, that said, However, this order system is also facing challenges in all its three fronts, of its three pillars. Uh, the financial crisis of 2007 exposed the flaws in the global economic governance. In the political sphere, the promotion of Western value in other parts of the world failed to achieve its claimed aim. And in the security field, it's, uh, it's, it's especially still about block politics. 
And in the Pacific, in Asia Pacific, for example, the U.S. seems to give greater care to the security interests of its allies uh, at the cost of countries like China who are outside, uh, excluded in its uh, military arrangements. What's more worrying is that uh, it has not provided good solutions to many new issues of the day, uh, as uh, many non-traditional and cross-border security threats are quickly dominating the world agenda. And the US leadership falls short of expectation due to its uh, domestic and international constraints. During my recent visit to the US, I observed that many think tanks are engaged in a new debate about who is the new strategic target and how to cope with the impact of the rise of China. And Dr. Henry Kissinger told me that what he thought the most was how much time and space are left for the US to maintain the current order and uh, to design a new order. And he believed, he discussed with me, at least we, uh, over the past two years, quite a few rounds, he believed that China and US should work together and can work together, but he also said it's not going to be without challenges. So oh, from, from the way I, I see it, uh, for the US, which remains the strongest of all the powers in today's world, whether the world order is able to adjust uh, and to change to, so that it can work with, instead of working against the new arrivals on the world stage, is a major test for the US. That's my first point. Now, the second is about, uh, 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 about China's experience uh, in the Chinese experience. In the, in, with the international order. Now, you may notice that now I'm using the term international order instead of world order, uh, because I think uh, they are not entirely the same, and I want to distinguish the two with these uh, different uh, terms. Uh, the international order China supports and identifies with is the UN framework. Uh, and its associated institutions built in the wake of World War II. It was uh, built for maintaining world peace and security and for providing principles and norms for fair and equitable relations among countries, which gave it a wider recognition and legitimacy. Uh, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi stated uh, in, uh, uh, at the fourth World Peace Forum held in Beijing last June, he said China was directly involved in designing and building the international order and the system with the United Nations at the centerpiece. And China will always be participant and a participant and a facilitator and a contributor to the international order. And in China, in its long history under the feudal kingdom, it maintained a stable and yet limited rela relationship with the outside world and developed its own understanding and the concept of a world under heaven. We say Tian Xia Guan, world under heaven. Uh, albeit constrained by its geographical uh, knowledge, China did not know that there was a bigger world beyond its uh, boundary. In the 19th century, the Western gunboat diplomacy forced open China's door and turned China's view of the world, or, or of the world upside down. Ever since China has started to integrate into the Western-dominated modern world, uh, not without pains, uh, hardship, and setbacks. And it was in 1971 that the People's Republic of China returned to the UN and embrace the international rules and norms based on the UN Charter. And Mr. Deng Xiaoping, who spoke at the UN General Assembly in April 1974, he explained for the first time to the world China's view on modern international order. He talked about the importance for developing countries to gain political independence 
It also highlighted the five principles of peaceful coexistence. And these have been China's uh, consistent policy in the past 40 years, ever since. For example, the latest con the 18th Party Congress mentioned in its report a call to make international order and the international system fairer and more reasonable. At the Asia, uh, Asian African Summit held in Indonesia in April, marking the 60th anniversary of the Bandung Conference, Chinese President Xi Jinping stressed the importance of promoting a more just and equitable international order and system. He also said that China is committed to developing friendship and cooperation with all countries on the basis of five principles of peaceful coexistence. So you see China repeatedly emphasizing these uh, uh, principles. Now China has uh, grown into a very active member of UN agencies and the international institution. For example, China has become the biggest contributor of uh, UN peacekeepers among the permanent members of the Security Council. Uh, so China has, uh, you can see that China has chosen to integrate itself into the international order and indeed has greatly benefited from being a member of this international uh, order and society. In the meantime, China also uh, talk about uh, the principle uh, of fairness, justice, openness, and equality to the international order, and support incremental reforms uh, to, that is needed to, for, the, for the system to adapt to the uh, new realities. And together with other emerging countries and the US and other countries together, China, uh, uh, China have actively promoted the progress in this direction of reform. The G20, the RCEP, the BRICS, uh, the uh, AIIB, Silk Road Initiative, the list can go on. And these all are good examples of uh, such uh, efforts. So China stands for enhancing and deepening the current international system centered on the UN system to promote its efficiency, its reach, and its representation in order to bring about a healthier and more equitable global market and environment conducive to development. And the fact that the AIB got support from more than 50 countries speaks to it. For international security cooperation, China stands for common, comprehensive, cooperative, and sustainable security. Uh, take uh, North Korea, for example. Uh, uh, in our discussions with the US, we often ask, does North Korea deserve a security? Maybe uh, uh, there are lots of things we disagree with North Korea, but uh, if uh, North Korean security is not uh, taken care of, uh, then the, the comprehensive security cannot be achieved. Uh, so uh, the comprehensive security we, we believe in is a security that covers all, and every, every country security should be taken care of in order to have a, a comprehensive uh, uh, security. Uh, we hope that the world will avoid going back to the old track of a power politics and power fight. And instead of an exclusive security model, we hope that the region and the world will go for comprehensive, cooperative, uh, and uh, coordinated security, which is being promoted in AIF, which has a history of more than 20 years, and Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and the Conference uh, on Interaction and uh, Confidence Building Measures in Asia. And they offer good examples. That is my second point. Uh, and let me make a bit of a comparison. Apparently, what the US is concerned about is that sooner or later, China will challenge US world power and its dominance over the international affairs. And uh, uh, the basis of US concern is that China has uh, grown uh, rapidly in its uh, uh, stands, stands in, stand in the international economy. Before the Iraq war, uh, China's GDP was about one-ninth of that of US. And after the 
Iraq war, China has grown to more than half of GDP of, of uh, United States. Uh, but uh, the way we see it, uh, uh, what US wants, paradoxically speaking, is to continue leading the world order while being reluctant to change the exclusive nature of the system or part of the system. So uh, for China, uh, a concern on power fight really belongs to the last century. And China comes from a very different history and tradition, uh, as I explained earlier. And China does not sus subscribe to lo logic of power politics. It has grown a strong belief in the international order and it remains an enthusiastic supporter of the principles of, and the purposes of the international order. That is why when US talks about China challenging the existing order and US leadership, the Chinese often feel perplexed. Chinese will say, we're part of the order, we're not ch challenging it. Well, we will build it together with other countries. It looks like that uh, on this issue, US and China seem to be talking past each other. Uh, that said, I, I don't think China and US are at uh, loggerheads about how uh, the order should, be, should evolve. Rather, uh, we share much in common in our views for today's world. For example, the pursuit for world peace and prosperity and the hope for strengthening and improving the UN system uh, the two countries also have a similar stance on nuclear non-proliferation as well as on the need to manage crisis and avoid conflicts uh, uh, among major countries. Even on some important political issues, both countries have made it clear that they do not have a grand strategy to undermine the other side. Uh, for example, U.S. Uh, has insisted that it has no intention to contain or blockade China. So on this important issue of 21st century order, will China and U.S. work in the same direction or will they be pulled apart in, into two directions? So my first, first point is about an inclusive global order for the 21st century. Uh, the 21st century saw, the 20th century, the last century, saw two major world wars which brought huge sufferings for the mankind. And then uh, within less than two years, maybe 18 months, the United States and the former Soviet Union, which were aligned during the war, became arch enemies. And they, they brought the world into 40 years of a long uh, Cold War, which split the world into uh, many two parts. Professor Nicholas Boy uh, of uh, Cambridge analyzed that uh, the character of a century became very apparent in the second decade. Uh, he, he, he gave examples in the past five centuries, uh, major events, a major event that changed the course of the whole century mostly happened in its uh, second uh, decade. Like uh, the 30 Years War in the 17th century, the Napoleon Wars in the 19th century, and the First World War in the 20th century. So now we are uh, at the second, uh, uh, second decade of the 21st century. Will the, war, will, will the world, will, can we, uh, free ourselves from this uh, model of uh, power fight, power struggle, uh, like in the past, uh, uh, a new equilibrium is achieved always through fighting, competition, even wars. Uh, Dr. Kissinger ended his book uh, on world order with, uh, with his last chapter entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? Um, and he, he did mention uh, uh, the reconstruction of an international uh, system. He said, this is an ultimate challenge to statesmanship in our time. And he also mentioned 
in, in the modern world, there is the need for a global world order. Uh, and that leaders of major countries need to rise above the urgency of day-to-day -day events and think about bigger issues bearing on the future of a world order. In the, indeed, uh, driven by the globalization, the world today is uh, more flat and the countries are a lot more interconnected. But when uh, it comes to order, different views, different perspectives exist, not just between China and US. Uh, uh, divergent trends have uh, also emerged in other parts of the world. Uh, for example, the ISIS, which claimed to restore Islamic uh, uh, caliphate. And uh, like Russia and US disagreement on Ukraine, giving rise to growing uh, animosity. Uh, I remember talking with the American uh, 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 State Department officials in charge of Ukraine and the Russian Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs. I had separate meetings with them, and I, at the end of the meeting, I, I discussed with my colleagues, I said, why, why the Americans are so angry? Why there is so much emotion? Uh, so, uh, so in today's world, when we are in a globalized they call economic system, uh, uh, can we continue this uh, separation, fragmentation of, uh, of uh, orders and systems? Perhaps at some stage, uh, the world can think about a bigger and more inclusive framework of uh, global order. I would use the term global order to echo uh, Henry Kissinger's thinking. Uh, we may compare uh, uh, such a framework to a, a mega umbrella, uh, and each and every member of the international community shall find its place and have a say. Uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping himself talked uh, on many occasions about community of a common interest or community of a common future. Uh, naturally, any discussion about a common future will be a long process of consensus building. And what's important, I think, is that in the 21st century, we need to think beyond the old concept of power politics or power equilibrium. Instead of uh, getting entangled in this, uh, this kind of di dispute, countries need to focus uh, on, on, developing, on development and uh, on finding solutions to common challenges, uh, not just the traditional ones, but also the most complicated new frontiers for which the mankind has uh, so little experience. And new challenges define sovereign boundaries and require creative and joint efforts. And China and US are at the center of uh, the challenges. We can get nowhere in this uh, important process, if the two countries continue to exclude each other or reject each other in political, security, or economic fields, they need to be aware of the risks and avoid irrit irritating or pointing fingers at each other. Uh, they should give stronger support to the UN and ASEAN uh, for helping to shape uh, consensus. Uh, be it uh, order or system, at the end of the day, it's all about communications and understanding among peoples. Therefore, uh, countries need to engage in more extensive dialogue at all levels. And China, as an emerging country, need to also need to learn how to better convey its policies and strategies and its intentions to the neighborhood and to the world, so as to gain more understanding and uh, support. So in this uh, 21st century, let's hope that uh, the mistakes led to the conflicts in the 20th century will not be repeated, and uh, we need to work together to ensure that this will be truly a century without major wars, and a peace and prosperity can last. A better global order, uh, if we will one day be able to work on it, can be built through 
intellectual crowdfunding. I'm borrowing a term, a financial term. It's very fashionable term in China, kind of a crowdfunding. And it should be a co-evolutionary process. And uh, it needs all countries to chip in. Thank you. Madam Fu Ying, you have uh, you've delivered uh, an excellent, very sophisticated, and I think very wise lecture in which you, you systematically um, talked, about, talked about three aspects of this question. You talked about the existing US-led international order and its, the shortcomings and, and challenges that it faces. You talked about China's view of, of international order and how that has evolved over time. And you talked about the way forward in terms of um, how China and the US might collaborate in, in constructing a, a more equitable and, and fairer world order that um, can deal with uh, the major challenges uh, that the world uh, faces and will, will face during this uh, century. Um, that was an extremely um, stimulating and, and I think in some ways challenging uh, perspective. Um, I'd, I'd like to um, ask our, our audience to come forward with their, their questions and, and points for you in a, in a few minutes, but there are, there are one or two things I'd like to ask you about first, if, if that's all right. Um, the, 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 the first question that, 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 that occurred to me um, re relates to um, the, the question of, of hard power, and it's really about my, my question is, is how, does, how does China handle the question of, of, of its own hard power and the usefulness of that, that hard power, particularly in terms of China's um, developing military capabilities? Um, do, does China see that hard power and those military capabilities um, which have clearly undergone very important uh, transformations in recent years. Does China see that sort of capability as the necessary, necessary underpinning uh, for e equality with the United States and, um, and therefore as an underpinning for um, a future more equitable, equitable and, and, and just uh, international order? Or, or is there some, or is there some other rationale? You want me to answer yes. now, or if, if, if you could. Uh, thank you for raising it. Uh, the, I, I've learned about hard power and soft power and the relationship in the '90s when I paid a long visit. I was on a tour in the U.S. Um, uh, and the, the 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 issue, the question for the for the delegation is uh, U.S. Uh, security policy making. And in those, in, in, it was 94, 93. Uh, and uh, wherever we went, we went to the military institutions, the, the universities, the think tank, and the factories, defense factories. Uh, and uh, our question was, uh, uh, I was, it was a team of uh, uh, diplomats from developing countries. Uh, and our question was, uh, uh, what was the objective for the US hard power? US was obviously the most powerful uh, in the wake of yes. co end of the Cold War. It had a very strong hard power. So uh, what was the target in the world? What, well, what did they want to achieve? And we were told repeatedly that it was uh, democracy, freedom, uh, human rights, all those soft, soft targets. Uh, I, I realized that the delegation who are mostly from developing countries had a great difficulties understanding how you are going to achieve mm. all those uh, soft uh, uh, targets, which is had, had the, it's very hard to, 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 to have set the boundaries, and then with your hard power, which is uh, so mightily strong in, in, in the world. And uh, 20 years uh, later, we could see what happened in the world. I think it's a, it's a lesson. It's a lesson uh, for US, 
and for the rest of the world, uh, setting the right target for your hard power. Now, coming back to China, uh, uh, this year also marks the uh, uh, 100 uh, years of the Jiawu War, and there were uh, there are lots of uh, uh, review and uh, and, uh, uh, and articles. The uh, the general uh, a deep lesson China has learned is that uh, China would suffer if it's too weak. China is big; it became a uh, it became uh, attractive to the uh, powers if China was weak and couldn't defend itself. As the lessons of the 19th and uh, 20th century, so China should be able to defend itself. Should have a strong enough hard power to make sure that these things will not repeat. Uh, but on the other hand, the constitution of China has made it very clear that China's defense. Uh, uh, defense uh, uh, capabilities are constrained to defensive nature. It's a defensive uh, in nature. So it is uh, uh, within the, the limit of defending its own interests. But uh, having said that, China has grown a bit uh, with the encouragement of UN uh, to, to uh, take part in some of the international uh, uh, peace uh, 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 undertakings, but mainly uh, solely within the UN authorization uh, uh, authorized uh, uh, activities. That's what is what is like now. Do you think that that maybe there is a danger of an arms race with the United States? Well, who can who can race with the US uh, for for armament is. Uh, Far, far beyond China. Okay, thank you. Um, my my second second question is is about um, is about the role of other major powers. Uh, you t you focused very much on on the role of China and the role of the United States, mm -hmm. but in the in the development of the sort of uh, new international order that you were talking about, what would be the role of what one might call the, the second world powers, the, the Japan and Europe and Australia and uh, Canada and um, other developed countries? And, and, and then what about uh, developing countries? How would, how would, their, how would their interests and, and concerns um, particularly where they, are, where they are smaller countries with less power, how would their interests be taken into account in the evolution of this new international order? Um, how, would we evolve, how would we avoid the danger of some sort of US-China uh, condominium? I, I, before I left, I read an article by a Chinese scholar Wang Jixi, who Wang Jixi is a, he 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 divided the world into uh, a few levels. One is one the U.S. superpower, and two is China EU, and the three, third level is uh, the countries you mentioned, and then the developing countries. Uh, 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 I think uh, in a way uh, maybe that is a, that is right, but uh, in today's world. Uh, it depends on what we are talking about. Uh, I think uh, if you talk about the per capita GDP, the, the, the economic development, China falls far behind. In China, in, from any big city, Beijing, Shanghai, any big city, you drive 100, 200 kilometers, you can see poverty, you can see underdevelopment. So this is a country which is on its way, on its way of, uh, of uh, uh, development. And China came from, uh, as you mentioned, the other developing countries. China, China came from that history, and China shares a lot with them. And most of the principles China advocates root in the, the relationship and interests of those uh, countries. Uh, well, that is why we hope that uh, if there is going to be a uh, uh, if there is going to be reform of the existing 
uh, international order, the, the interests of those countries should be better taken care of. Well, I think I've, thank you very much. I, I, I think I've had my turn at asking questions, so we'll now turn to, the, uh, turn to our audience. Um, if, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, the microphone will come to you. Um, if, I, if I recognize you, could you please say, um, when you get the microphone, please say who you are and what your affiliation is, and then please uh, ask your question as briefly as possible, sir, just in the third row back here. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, madam, for sharing your insights. Um, I'm Mahmoud Ali, a member of the IIAS and a student of US-China uh, relations. I wonder whether you and your colleagues, Madam, recognize that a coalition, not so tacit anymore, has been forming around China's periphery, particularly in the Western Pacific area of the last five, six, seven, eight years now. And if you do recognize that such a coalition is indeed forming around China, whether you see that as a failure of Chinese diplomacy or whether you see that as a price China must pay for, for its way in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Do we take two at a time, or? We, we can take, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, sir. Thank you, Madam Fuying, for your very elucidating um, presentation. Paul Supramanian, I'm a practicing lawyer. Um, I wanted to ask you what view China takes about the newly emerging concept of lawfare Lawfare, L-A-W-F-A-R-E, as opposed to warfare. It's a concept under which international laws are crafted and created, a historic rewriting of territorial boundaries, etc. So it'd be interesting to hear the Chinese concept on that, uh, whether you see it as an evolving principle which big nations can now seek to use as part of how they redefine the international order, and whether you would see the recent Chinese air defense identification zone in the East China Sea as a facet of lawfare. Thank you. Maybe one more question. Thank you. In the, in the, red, the red shirt. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Solve, S-O-L-V-E-R-E. So, um, I think, may I ask Madam Fu, whether Chinese defense force is to defend Chinese or also defend other peace-loving people. In 1839, October, Chinese Qing Navy failed to protect peace-loving Quaker Oak ship from British forces because Quaker Oak ship refused to carry opium. And both Qing and Quaker Oak ship were sank by British forces. So it's Chinese forces is to defend peace-loving people on their own land or just defend Chinese interests? Thank you very much. Can I add a Very point? briefly, yes. very briefly. It is said that this incident may impress uh, Samuel Huntington to impress the world that the, world, the West won the world not by superiority in ideas, belief, or religion, but by superiority of applying organized violence. I think this is sad because the West has a lot of contributions to the world. Okay, it is this wrong. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Adam Fruz, uh, thank you. Three, a range thank of you. questions there for thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, I think I forgot to answer your uh, last part of your question about uh, U.S.-China. Uh, 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 I think China uh, would like to work with the U.S., but not in the way of G2. Well, it's because uh, probably many other countries wouldn't like it. And China wouldn't like being uh, managed by G2, G3 above China. So there's a saying in China that if you don't want to be done on uh, with something, you don't do it on others. Uh, the, the, about uh, <coughs> China's neighborhood, uh, 
in China, I, I speak to uh, the domestic audience to different provinces, and this question come up too. The, uh, the, the, according to the media, if you read the newspapers, you think, oh, well, China has problem all around itself. Uh, and the Chinese uh, audience would ask, why? Why our neighbors all turn into unfriendly? Uh, I, I have the same answer to them and to you. I, I worked on Asia uh, since the uh, 90s, and uh, I've uh, seen how our relationship with the Asian countries uh, 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 has grown. The, now China is number one trading partner to almost every of our neighbor. Uh, and the, the people-to-people uh, uh, exchanges is huge. Uh, last year, about uh, 100 million Chinese traveled abroad, and uh, more than half of them are in Asia. So I, would, I wouldn't say that the relationship with our neighbors uh, uh, are in crisis or having problems, uh, but the media may magnify it. Uh, one one issue uh, and uh, making it, a, it as if it's a dominant issue. And for that one issue, uh, I still think there is a hope of uh, uh, coming back to the China ASEAN way, uh, keeping it uh, uh, under uh, discussions. So I think China's uh, foreign policy has been uh, successful in supporting China's uh, opening up and reform uh, 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 policy. Uh, however, I also understand your, your point. I think China now is at a higher stage. Though we still think we're a developing country, but uh, uh, the world looks up uh, at China, expecting that China should uh, behave more like a big power and take more responsibilities. So I, that's, that's, a, that's something China needs to grow into. China needs to learn, uh, I, I think. For the law fair, uh, I, I have to admit that I'm not familiar with the term, but uh, I understand law is not making war. Law is, uh, law is uh, for preventing uh, conflict. Um, the air defense uh, zone uh, was, uh, uh, I think, to myself, uh, uh, I was a bit surprised at the response. Maybe, uh, uh, the, as uh, suggested by some uh, American scholars and uh, in the neighborhood, maybe they, it can be managed in, a, in, another, in a better way, like a, a better notification, better explanation, or, or exp explanation beforehand instead of afterwards. Uh, but for the Chinese, uh, uh, it's uncomfortable to see that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, for example, U.S. Uh, designed and uh, uh, set up the uh, defense, uh, air defense zone for Japan about 40 years ago. And how come when China is doing it uh, uh, 40 years later, uh, becomes a problem? So that, that's a bit, a bit uh, of a surprise for China, too. Uh, I think uh, it, uh, it's kind of wake-up call, wake-up call. And maybe uh, on the one hand, uh, the region needs to understand that the China is growing, China has an interest, uh, and China will defend its interests uh, the way uh, the law, international practices, international uh, laws allow. Uh, on the other hand, China needs to communicate better with the region, we, we, as I mentioned in my speech, to, China needs to explain to its neighbor and to the world its intention, its strategies. Uh, 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 there is a possibility, I think, uh, there is a need to improve as far as communication is concerned. And the neighborhood, in the neighbor, I think the neighbors and U.S. should also, I don't know, they should, should also have a fairer uh, attitude towards China. Uh, because in China, most people feel that we are always the wrong guy, whatever we do. <laughs> okay. well, thank you for those good answers. I think we have time uh, for, for two more questions, if that's I all. did not do. 
the the, oh, you'd I like think to the, the, the yeah. last question yeah. is about. Uh, I, I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, the reason I keep on saying that let's move into the 21st century is because the 20th century and 19th century are gone, and the world is not like that anymore. I, I don't think now China can go to a country and say, okay, you can't defend yourself, let, let us do it for you. We don't believe in it. And uh, 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 I think this is, a, this is a new world, and let's uh, behave and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, set up a system which, which suits the new realities. Thank you. But the history, uh, the, the lesson of history needs to be remembered. That's, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. we, I think we have time for two more questions, if you'd be, if you'd be happy to respond sure. to those. Uh, Mr. Soria. I'm Surya from the Institute of South Asian Studies here at the National University of Singapore. Ma'am, you have spoken eloquently about the centrality of the United Nations in even the evolving international order. But there is no consensus now on the existence of P5. Many countries don't like P5 with veto powers. Would you suggest that P5 should be done away with, or how should that be reformed? Thank you. Thank you. So Hi, my name is Aaron Wong. I'm from KPMG. Um, my question is, what are the significance of and political ramifications of China setting up a competing financial institution to that traditionally spearheaded by US, Japan, and Europe? And would China move into um, exerting its influence through economic might rather than militaries? And what are your views on the unification with Taiwan, for instance? Thanks. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, one more here. Sorry. Hi, my name is Hiro. I'm a researcher from Center on Asia and Globalization, the Kuan Yu School of Public Policy. Um, I have a question regarding alleged Chinese nationals who transit in Southeast Asia uh, and eventually join terrorist groups. Um, according to media report, Chinese Vice Minister Vice Minister of Public Security said um, there are more than 300 uh, Chinese nationals have used Malaysia as a transit point to join Islamic State. Meanwhile, we know that at least hundreds of Uyghurs uh, came to Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia to find their way to Turkey. So my question is, uh, based on your assessment, do you believe there are the majority of these Uyghurs are actually potential terrorists, or are they, are they simply seeking better lives outside China? And the reality, my second question is, uh, if they are indeed potential terrorists, are there in, uh, what kind of additional countermeasures should China and ASEAN countries take? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. OK. Well, three questions. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, first about uh, Perm 5, uh, China has stood for reform, uh, uh, supporting the reform of Perm, Perm 5. And the emphasis uh, 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 China makes is about enlarging it uh, to take more developing countries' voices. This is already very much uh, uh, dominated by developed world. And in the current reform, it seems uh, there is a still a stronger support for the developed world to, to, to have more members. So I, I think China would uh, prefer uh, and it will support the, the reform in, in, in the direction of allowing greater voice for the, for the developing world. About, a, about the new institution, I, I think, Mr. Wang, you refer to, you're referring to AIB. Uh, the, uh, I'm glad that there is uh, such a strong support, uh, not only from Asia, but also from uh, uh, European countries. When I was in the US in May, uh, in many of the think tanks, the American scholars told me that the, the, the American think tanks tend to disagree with each other. But there is one thing they all agree, that uh, US made a mistake not to join AIB. Uh, so, uh, if uh, U.S., uh, the, the, the general trend is in support, it shows it's, a, it's the right thing. Uh, uh, there was a 
there was some politicization or some doubts expressed on AIB. I think it's mainly, uh, it's again what I said, the, the feeling in China that whatever China does is always a doubt. Uh, I think we shouldn't totally blame the outside world. I think we need to, to, to better explain ourselves. And for AIB, it's really aimed at providing financial tool to help the region. And there's a World Bank, there's the ADB, uh, IMF. Uh, all of them have supported China in China's uh, reform and development. We gained uh, uh, tremendously from their assistance. But uh, there are things they're not doing, especially in the infrastructure fields. So uh, uh, China, uh, uh, China had an experience of uh, funding partly the highway from from Yunnan to Laos to Thailand. It's a Kunman, Kunman Highway. And it's a very good experience. And the Laos, they, 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 they really think it has helped not only transportation, but also helped poverty elevation. It's a very good project. So the Laos, they wanted a railway to be built along the highway, uh, which costs hugely. Uh, and China, for China, uh, to, to build a, a railway entirely by Chinese funding outside its boundary was, a, was a very, very much out of our way. But we did respond positively. But uh, with that experience, we think uh, we'd prefer a regional financial structure which can better uh, uh, finance the regional development at the same time with the Chinese uh, 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 investment as well. And also China itself, I think we are lack of experience doing it by ourselves. So we, we would like to work together with, with, with the region with the participation of other more experienced countries. And World Bank, Asian Bank actually are in support. And they are deeply involved in its design and its rule uh, uh, making process. So I think the, the fuss over AIB should serve as a lesson uh, for the world and to, to avoid uh, reading too much out of the good, th good things. Uh, and China needs to be encouraged to do more things like that, to provide the public good in areas China know better. China knows better in areas China is more confident. And the uh, Silk Road uh, connectivity initiatives, both in land and on the, uh, in the sea, is also based on such uh, thinking about uh, terrorism issue, uh, it's a big challenge. It's a big challenge uh, uh, not only for, for us in the region, but also for the developed world, like in US, UK, it's a huge headache. And Prime Minister Cameron recently made a long speech in, in UK to call for the young people to avoid going, taking the wrong uh, path. So I think this is an area the world needs to work together uh, and the region needs to work together. But I think we should avoid, avoid singling out an ethnic uh, group in, in a certain country. In China, we are a country of 50, uh, uh, 56 ethnic uh, uh, nationalities. I myself, I'm from a Mongolian uh, nationality. So uh, uh, the Uyghurs, we have a huge population of Uyghurs who are just like uh, who are Chinese, just like any any uh, other ethnic group. So uh, uh, the majority of them are very uh, uh, patriotic, and they are they. I think they are a very important part of, of, of the country. Uh, not only improving, trying hard to improve their own lives, and also contributing to the development of the country. So I think uh, we should separate. We should not, uh, we should not uh, uh, look at the terrorism issue as an ethnic issue as a, or as a religious issue. Uh, uh, that will help us to better address uh, these issues. Uh, to end my note, uh, to end my uh, answer, I think uh, it shows that in this region, uh, it, I think your questions have uh, helped me to believe, uh, uh, to strengthen my belief that we have uh, so many things to work together and this is such a changed world, and we really need to uh, grow out of the 20th century as soon as possible and uh, start thinking about 21st century. Thank you.
And on, on that uh, very uh, upbeat note, for which we thank you, Madam Fu, I'm afraid we need to bring this session to a close. I'd like to thank you very much um, for answering those questions so, uh, so fully. And, uh, and thank you to our audience for asking such a, a good range of, of diverse and sometimes uh, challenging questions. Madam Fu, your Fullerton lecture today and your, your, um, your discussion with us uh, subsequently, I think have added substantially to our, to our understanding of the, of the debate about the, the future international order and the shape that it might take and the, role, the roles of China and the United States and other countries in, uh, in formulating that order. Um, so thank you again for, for a really, really excellent Fullerton lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.